So today we are going to start our journey and talk about synthesis. Uh, I'll just briefly outline where we're going to go with this. Now, I'll tell you right now, this is this was probably my favorite class as an undergraduate in mathematics. Uh, one because the professor Richard Mitchell from Santa Cruz, uh, he you know, is just one of the most gifted lecturers and brightest men I've ever met. Uh, but also because the material is in some ways very different from what other material see as an undergraduate, and it's really compelling stuff. So uh, we have to start very simple, though, because we're simple things, right? Absolutely. Mathematicians, we, we don't know anything. Who said that? Okay, so. There are two words I wrote on the board, complex analysis. Complex refers to complex numbers. The analysis is the mathematician's way of saying calculus. Right. We want to do calculus on, well, it doesn't make sense to say the cal on the complex numbers, right? But what is it that you do calculus on? Well, on, on functions, right? You look at derivatives and integrals of functions, right? And up to this point, most of everything you've ever done is with real numbers. Right? So you looked at functions of real numbers. And you, when you took multivariable calculus, you had uh, functions of several variables, but they were still from the real numbers to the real numbers. Or, uh, so, so this is looking at the same sort of setup, only we're assuming now we look at functions from the complex numbers to the complex numbers. So that begs the question, what is a complex number? Okay, so let's start with a quick definition. Say something which is ridiculous, but just gets me out of trouble. Let's say it's a symbol. I want, I want to say it's a number, right? But what's a number? So it's a symbol of the form A plus BI, where A and B. Are real numbers. Okay, and at this point, let me pause just to, to explain some notation if you haven't seen it before. Okay, A and B, these are uh, Roman letters. That's uh, a common note. This symbol here means is an element of. Also, sometimes written like this in the old days, but don't do that. Nobody ever writes it that way. It's not the Greek letter epsilon. So it's, a, it's like a subset sign, but then you draw a line down the middle. So that means there's an element of, and this big R, right, this is a set of real numbers. So here, this red A and B are, well, okay, the is, you have to be careful. If you have more than one, then you say R. A and B are elements of the and, well, you got this funny eye on the end, which at some point in your life you've probably seen, right, is supposed to denote the square root of minus 1. And, of course, this is ridiculous because there is no real number that when you square it, it gives you minus 1. Um, but somehow this comes into the game, and we'll talk about that later. Why, why it makes sense to even talk about this in the first place. So a complex number is just some symbol that looks like this. Right? It's really a collection of symbols, but in any case, it's some statement, right? A plus B I. Right? So for instance, uh, three plus five I. Okay? There's a nice complex number. Or uh, pi plus E I. Or pi. Now, actually, if I write it this way, the way I define these things, 
it's not quite right, because this says it has to be of the form pi plus something i. So how do I make this right? Plus zero, zero i. Plus zero i. But of course, I'm never ever going to want to keep writing these down. So we abuse notation. And we just identify this symbol with pi. Of course, I can also play the same game on the other side and write ei. If I write it again, I have ei, ei, and then you add an o. <laughs> and of course, this one, we have the same problem as when we just had pi, right? This isn't quite right. You have to write this as 0 plus ei, but we identify right, with ei. Okay, so that we don't have to write this as 0. Okay. So, uh, already, you can see that there's some interesting things going on. One, there's there's this part that has the I, there's this part that doesn't have the I. Okay? We'll call that the real part, we'll call that the imaginary part. I'll write all these things down explicitly later. Uh, that is tomorrow. Okay. In any case, though, uh, the real numbers by themselves are, are part of the complex numbers, right? Under this identification, right? Where pi corresponds to pi plus zero I. Okay. So in your your world view where you start with the integers, right, and then you build, oh, I got fractions, right, like the rationals, and then, then you have the real numbers, right, well, now you have another set to put around it, and it's the complex numbers. Okay. So let me just quickly yeah, the set of complex numbers is denoted I see. Okay, and we use this blackboard to see what the line going through, just like with the real function. Okay. okay, so now that you know what a real number is, uh, everything else is going to look a lot like calculus for a little bit. So we're going to look at properties of these complex numbers. How do you add them? How do you multiply them? Right? How can you determine like the uh, the size of a complex number? Okay. These are always uh, interesting things. How can you picture them? And let me just quickly say, if you if you want to picture the real numbers, we use the real number line. Where's two? Right. Well, put zero in the middle. If you want to where two is? Two is right there. Okay. All right. There's your picture. Very easy. If you want to picture the complex numbers, you can't do it on a real number line. So you might think, ah, I need a complex number line. But of course, this is problematic, right? Because, uh, I mean, there's a nice order here, right? 0, 1, 2, 3, okay. How do I order these complex numbers in like that? Could I, oh, yeah, certainly there's a 0, right? 0 plus 0i, zero uh, which, by the way, we have. We have to make a choice there, which one we abuse to. Do we abuse it to zero or zero i, but we choose zero, of course. Uh, what's the next complex number, right? It's not even the way. What's, a, what's the right direction? Is one the way to go, or is it i the way to go? Of course, I mean, of course yeah, this just gives it away. Right? There's no answer. Okay. Right. The answer is, well, we, we don't do it with a line. We do it with a plane. And we put down here, well, we leave the real numbers right there the x-axis. Uh, but up here we're going to put down, well, what I'll write as ri. Okay. What do I mean by ri? I mean a real number times i. So now we can we can graph the thing. So for instance, if I wanted to put uh, 2 plus 3i, go up here, okay. really this could be labeled 3i, but usually well, you may not even label it at all, but you can label it either way. As long as it's clear, this is the i-axis. So this is this is 2 plus 3i. Now this looks a lot like graphing in R2, right, where you have x comma y. And there's a lot of parallels. There's, by the way, this is usually called the complex plane. So 
we're going to be able to picture these things. Uh, but unlike uh, with the real numbers, we're thinking where the next step is very easy, it's going to be very hard to do the next step in the complex one. For the real numbers, once you start talking about numbers, you run out of things to say fairly quickly. What becomes interesting is when you start talking about functions. Right? That's where calculus is really, really quite powerful, right? It's, it's analyzing functions. And so how do you, well, the first thing you do when you start talking about a function is, oh, let me see if I can graph it. Right? So how does a function work, right? Well, if you have a function from R to R, you plot a point on the real number line, apply the function to it, that gives you a point on this, the y-axis, and then you can plot that point. How would you do it for the complex plane? Well, let's see. If you had a function which ate a complex number and spit out another complex number, then it's got to get, eat something in the plane, and it's got to spit out something in the plane. It's pretty hard to graph that actually in the plane. Right? It actually requires a four-dimensional uh, world to do that. And um, I don't think this year we're getting the four-dimensional whiteboard. Maybe, maybe in a couple of years we'll get that in. No, we can't do that. So graphing things is going to take a little more effort. We're going to have to be a little more creative to, to try to graph complex functions. But we'll, we'll have some of this. Okay, now once, once we get a handle on what complex functions are, we're going to start to talk about well, sort of the same old song and dance as you did when you took calculus. Right? So you'll start with complex functions. And then we're going to talk about things like limits. Okay? That's the foundation right, of calculus. We're going to understand what a limit is. We're going to talk about continuity. What's the next thing on the list? Everybody who was in my class this morning. Right? Derivative, differentiability. So we're going to do all these things for complex functions. We're going to tell you what it means to have a limit of complex function, what does it mean for a complex function to be continuous, when is it differentiable. Now let me highlight one brief aspect about limits which makes it a little more interesting than it was for the real numbers. When you have a real function, similar examples I used this morning, if you wanted to compute the limit at a point A, what did you check? You checked the function coming in from the left, and you checked the function coming in from the right. If the limits exist and they agree, then the limit exists everywhere, right? It's a two-sided limit. If they don't exist, then it does, the limit doesn't exist. If they don't agree, then the limit doesn't exist. Okay, fine. So you need two different limits to agree, right? Two one-sided limits to agree. When we deal with complex functions, it gets much, much worse. Let's say that I want to consider, whatever this means, the limit as... Oh, by the way, in real number land, uh, our variable is always x, right? f of x equals x squared, that sort of thing. In complex number land, where it's going to be z. So let's say I want to take the limit as z goes to the complex number a plus bi. Okay. And I want to know what's happening to this function, f of z, whatever that function is. So f here is a function that eats a complex number and spits out a complex number. Well, let me draw the complex plane. And I'll plug this number uh, a plus bi in. There's a and there's b. So okay, here's a plus bi. Now, when I say I take the limit as z approaches a plus bi, that means that I'm a looking at complex numbers that are getting close, we have to define what close means, but whatever it means, but they're getting close to a plus bi. Well, how can I get close to a plus bi? I mean, I could go this way and get close. I could go this way to get close. I could go this way to get close. I could go this way to get close. I could go 
could go this way to get close. I could go this way to get close. I could go this way to get close. I could go this way to get close. Okay. There's a lot of different ways to get close. That sounds like a good love song. <laughs> So, it's going to mean something much stronger to say that a limit exists, because we are going to insist for a limit to exist that you get the same answer no matter what path you take to get to this point. For real numbers, it's easy. I just check two paths. We don't just have two one-sided limits anymore, right? We have a lot of possible limits, infinitely many, of course, okay? which means it'll be harder to prove that these limits exist. The upshot is, if you prove something that requires more work, right, and it's really, it really is harder to prove, you usually will get a more powerful result out of it. And it's going to turn out that a function, uh, for instance, which is differentiable, which of course requires a limit to exist, is going to be far more powerful than a real function which is differentiable. Which is what's going to make the subject really neat. There's going to be some theorems that would never ever, ever possibly hold for real numbers, but which hold for complex functions. No problem. Okay, so we're going to get to differentiability. Uh, I'll just throw in some buzzwords here uh, so that you've heard them once and so that you know how to pronounce these names. Uh, once, you, once we talk about differentiability, we're going to define a class of functions which will be somehow the cornerstone of this class. Uh, and those are called analytic functions. Also, something's called holomorphic functions. These are basically functions which are differentiable on some open set, whatever an open set is. And then to test whether a function is analytic, we're going to use something called the Cauchy Riemann equations, which Without writing them up, don't, it doesn't really mean anything. I'm only showing it to you because I want you to be able to pronounce, to pronounce Cauchy and Riemann. Uh, especially Cauchy. His name is going to be all over this class. He, he and the Cauchy integral formula, the Cauchy Riemann equations. And uh, that's better, that's actually it. No, we're gonna say we're gonna say these things. Okay. Uh, so this is sort of the, the derivative side. Right? And of course, calculus is always divided up into two sides: derivatives and antiderivatives. All right, antiderivatives. Right, the integration. So, so then we'll move into the integration stuff. Now, the integration stuff is cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. The integration stuff is really good. So it, uh, I won't say uh, too much because I know a lot of you are taking multivariable calculus right now, so it wouldn't mean as much to you. But uh, yeah, uh, we're going to be able, for those of you who have taken multivariable, you have a few of these really cool theorems like. Green's theorem, Stokes' theorem, the divergence theorem, tell you how to integrate uh, these vector fields and so forth, right? Line integrals, that sort of thing. So we're going to get comparable sort of stuff going on with complex functions. But it's going to be really neat how we resolve the issues that show up there. Uh, so let me just, just give you a few of the ideas. We're going to talk about things called contour integrals. And uh, generally speaking, what, what this is going to be about is, uh, well, contour, think, think of a line going through space. A real function, right, when you integrate, you're always integrating over just a nice line segment on the real axis. A contour, you can integrate over a, a contour in the complex plane. Okay, so we're going to define what that means. So we'll do contour integrals, also line integrals. The big highlight of this section 
is going to also involve Cauchy and this is Cauchy's integral theorem. And all, by the way, all of these things are, we're really going to do for analytic functions, right? These analytic functions come back. These are functions which are already differentiable. Uh, in particular, they don't have problems in their domain. Right? We're always looking, you know, we want functions defined. You say, okay, I have this nice set. I want it defined everywhere in this set. There's no problem. And so up to about here, that's how we're always going to work. We're always just going to assume you're living in the complex plane. And you may have some region where you, you want to define a complex function, right? We're not always going to talk about complex functions that are defined on the whole complex plane. Right? We're not going to deal with that. We're mostly going to say, okay, assume you have uh, some, some domain D, right? And the function is defined everywhere in here. Okay? And now I, may, I want to integrate the function over some contour living in this domain. Maybe it looks like this. I want to integrate it over that piece. Which makes sense, right? The function is defined everywhere in the red, and then I have just some path inside the red, and I want to define I want to define an integral over that. Whatever that means, right? We don't know yet. But just think of the line segment in real numbers. That's all that represents. Yeah. Um, because in the real numbers, when you took the integral, you're basically finding the area below. Uh, below so the curve above. Right. Yeah. So in this case, would you be finding like an area of a shape? It's 3D shape. It's not. It's not as straightforward because, I mean, for instance, we're living in a four-dimensional right. world when we try to graph this. Right. Um, what we're trying to do is actually generalize the mechanics, but we are going to, in the end, have to lose the intuition of area to a certain extent. Okay. Right. In multivariable calculus, you could you could still use it, right? Because you, you evaluate some triple integral and get volumes. Right. All right. Or evaluate a, a line integral. It, it's going to be worse in the complex world. We're not going to be able to just interpret these things so nicely as an area. We have to give up that. So that's one drawback. Uh, so, uh, what, so once we get here, this is going to be sort of the, the pinnacle of this world of, of integrating over a domain and the function is always defined and, and differentiable. Where we'll get it, even more interesting is when we drop that assumption. The next bit, this one, this is this is what we're aiming towards for the whole class, is to talk about something called residues, and that's where you have a problem. Right? Maybe uh, maybe your function is not defined at zero. For instance, uh, well, you can imagine. function f of z equals 1 over z. It doesn't matter that we're in a class of complex analysis. Dividing by 0 is still not allowed. Yeah? No good. Uh, so, boom, this would give you a, a hole in your function at 0. Right? So it's not defined there. But it might, it's defined certainly everywhere else in the complex. We don't know what it means to divide by a complex number yet, but I can assure you it's defined everywhere but at 0. So all of a sudden, when you try to integrate around this, which, by the way, the word pole is going to show up, which is uh, whenever you have this sort of a uh, divide by 1 over z or 1 over z squared, these sort of easy ones, they're going to be called poles, which is going to be a source of endless jokes uh, because of, well, people from Poland are poles also. So there's a lot of jokes that we'll talk about. In any case, when you try to integrate around things that have a pole in the middle, it's going to cause a problem. And so you have to come up with clever ways of solving this problem. Uh, and that's going to be all part of the subject of a residue. And residues is one of the more curious aspects of complex analysis, because what they allow you to do in the end uh, is the following. Start with a real calculus problem. Okay, when I say this, I mean, a, a, I don't mean that it's a, as opposed to a fake calculus problem. I mean, <laughs> all right, a calculus problem that has to do with, say, just integrating a real function, single variable, really nice and easy. You have this real calculus problem. 
and you don't know how to solve it. It's a definite integral, and you just don't know how to, to do it. Right? Maybe it's a unit you're integrating from minus infinity to infinity. You're just stuck. You turn it into a complex calculus problem. And in this complex calculus problem, which you've by the way, there's a, there's a method to doing this, right? So it's not just guessing. You set it up so that you can use the theory of residues. You solve the problem in the complex world, and then you use a special theorem uh, by Jordan, or Jordan. And in the end, you're left with a real answer. Really? <laughs> And in many cases, there's just no nice way to go directly from here to here. But by stepping into the complex world, you can do some work and then step back and get a real answer. And very quickly, right? very easily. So uh, this is one of the powerful ways in which complex analysis is used to solve real problems, as opposed to the actual real world applications, which I'm trying to get a couple engineers to come in and tell you guys about it at some point. Uh, it turns out that complex numbers are used in electrical engineering quite a bit. I have another question now. Yeah. Because you said that you can uh, you can determine what area you're taking the integral from. What area? I mean like uh, you know like you can pick that green yeah, yeah, space. Yeah, yeah. What it may be given to you. Okay, right. Yeah. yeah. But Someone chooses it. Yeah, yeah. So if you had like a pole, couldn't you just like break it up into different sections and then just add them together, excluding the pole? Well, here's a in in one sense you have the, the right idea, especially if you have a lot of poles, because there could be more than one pole. Right. Uh, <laughs> I told you that the the pole lock jokes would start. Yeah, but they're called bullocks, not poles. They're what? Pollocks. Yeah, but poles is also, I mean, they're also poles. Yeah, no, I mean, this is true. They're all true. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's the thing. What you, you might think is, well, let me kind of isolate this a little bit and just do everything outside of it first. Okay. Okay, so I've done most of the integral, right? I just have this little thing left. You might take this ring and start shrinking it shrinking and shrinking it. So you're doing more and more, but eventually you get stuck at this pole. You can't get rid of it, it's there. And and that causes, that's that's where the problem is. Right? You can't get rid of everything. You can only, you can just keep shrinking it, but the pole is always sitting there in the middle. And you have to take account of it. It does affect things. Well, sure, but I mean like, for instance, if you had like a real, a real function, right? And you had, for instance, what you had before, where you had um, an open circle. Couldn't you theoretically like take an integral of like? So maybe you're thinking something like this, where okay, say you have a discontinuity at A, and right. you're trying to integrate uh, along this so line, so, right? You have a problem there. So you just break it up and integrate from here to here, from here to here. Correct. Yeah. It doesn't work as easily for complex numbers. Yeah. We're, we're, usually, what will happen is this will contribute like two pi i. Okay. <laughs> when, when we get to this stuff, you'll see where it's coming. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, so this is this is going to show. Yeah, I, I, should, I, I said Cauchy's integral theorem doesn't take into account these things. It does a little bit. Uh, there's a couple versions that we'll talk about. Uh, okay, so so this is where we're, we're heading with this. And so hopefully the goal for the class is to get to these residues. They're pretty, uh, pretty exciting stuff. So tomorrow we will start at the beginning, really. Uh, well, you've already seen the definition of a complex number. I won't need to define that again, but we're going to have to define all these things very carefully in the beginning. And that'll help you with the homework. All right, I will see you tomorrow.